Uh, Amy, you have started recording um, for purposes of taking the minutes. And uh, uh, speaking of which, uh, we did not review. Uh, everyone got the agenda and minutes, I hope, uh, that were sent out with uh, a bunch of other material. Uh, did people get the uh, agenda in minutes? Yeah. I hope. Okay. So the first thing I would like to do is uh, uh, review two sets of minutes. The oldest is May 4th, and I, I want to uh, thank, uh, I assume Amy uh, does the minutes from the recording. Is that correct, Amy and Michael? Mm -hmm. Yes. And um, I find them not only complete, but in the May 4th minutes, under the health, I've read a lot of minutes in 76 years of living. And for the first time, I think, ever, uh, I cite the word quiescent. Um, Phil Weinberg said, stated the health committee had been quiescent. I don't think I've ever seen that word in the minutes before, ever. So to a combination of Phil and Amy for including the word quiescent, <laughs> we don't give out gold stars, but that's a first for me anyway. Someone else may have said, oh, yeah, I see that all the time, but I've never seen it before. So uh, congratulations on that. And uh, uh I think, and I also found the, the minutes of July 13th to be uh, comprehensive, accurate, complete. Um, and it, do people, did people find any errors or omissions on either of the minutes? If not, I'd accept a motion to approve both sets of minutes for uh, July 13th and May 4th. So, so Jim. Uh, Jim Whiten uh, made the motion. I think Mike, Michael Sullivan seconded. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Opposed? Aye. aye. Oh, okay. Uh, the minutes are approved. Uh, next on the agenda, uh, Michael Burris was going to give us an update on uh, MVP 2.0. Yes. Let me share one of my screens. Okay, do you see the MVP 2.0 summary of actions on here? We do. Great. So as you all know, we, uh, we received funding for the MVP 2.0 program. And so as a component of that, we had to release an RFP. Um, and we did that. We released that last month. I'm getting a little bit of feedback from someone. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll mute me and that. Oh, thank you. Um, anyway, so we uh, we re released the, we put out an RFP um, last month, and earlier this month we selected, um, we selected our vendor, and our vendor is going to be SERPED. We, those of you who don't know the acronyms that we tend to speak in, it's the Southeastern Regional Planning and Economic Development District. Uh, we'll be working with uh, their environmental division and the division's director, Helen Zincavage, she's really great. Uh, we've worked with her on another different, um, exploring different different grants and, and whatnot um, throughout the year, and she's been been a great help. So we know SERPED, they know us. I think it's, it's, a, it's a really great fit. Now, because SERPED does not have an extensive background in um, doing diversity, equity, and inclusion outreach, we do have to find a subcontractor. Um, and so this week on Wednesday, they met with a, a, a DEI firm called Conditioning Leaders. 
And through their meeting with conditioner, conditioning leaders, it does seem like we have found our subcontractor. So that's really great. We can, um, once we get our contracts in place with, uh, with SERPED and conditioning leaders, um, we'll be able to, to get things moving. Um, in the meantime, what we've been doing is that we, we've been working on identifying community leaders who, um, who can help us get connected to um, groups who might be disproportionately affected by climate change. And so what these, the, the groups that we're looking at, um, it can range anywhere from high school students to uh, people living in Westport's environmental justice community to people working in uh, industries like farming or um, people from the disability community and so on. Um, and, and so these, are, these, these groups of, of folks are going to be half of our core team. And we're, they'll be referred to as the community liaisons. And so if you look on the MVP summary of actions, we're kind of somewhere between steps zero and two. We're, we're doing several, several different things at the same time. Um, but we're, uh, we're working on getting the, the vendor selected and all those contracts hammered away. And we're also looking towards doing those groundwork pieces and, and setting our foundations for rec recruiting a core team. The other component of our core team, um, the other half, I guess I should say, is going to be more of town representatives. Um, so the, the planning board is going to be represented through staff and the Climate Resilience Committee is going to be represented um, by Jeff Canton. Um, Jeff Canton is uh, was a was a um, I think a pretty pretty natural pick for this because he's the chair of the engagement and Out outreach subcommittee. Um, and then we're also thinking about uh, doing getting the Commission on Disabilities involved and the Council on Aging. Um, so. To open this up to all of you, and I, I think this is an area where we can all brainstorm together as a group, is who do you think can get us connected to people in Westport who might be part of a group that would be disproportionately affected by climate change? Um, so to lead by example, one group that we're looking at um, reaching out to is the Westport Food Pantry, and to see if they have any any folks that they work with who might be interested in being a, um, a, a, a community liaison um, to help out with this process. And um, one thing to keep in mind is that these, these volunteers will get paid. Um, so there's a little bit more, um, it's not, not just, you know, it's not just a, a typical volunteer position. There, there will be a, um, a payment structure for the volunteers. We haven't quite worked that out, um, but volunteers will get paid. Um, so I'll turn it over to you all, but just asking, who do you think the, the community leaders are um, who can get us connected to members of our more vulnerable communities? And I'll just open up the floor to anyone who wants to jump in. Um, we got some... Uh, folks here muted if so, people um, raise your hand phil Weinberg. Well, I was, um you know from a from a health perspective um you know it's it's really the aging population um and so i think you know uh, working through the council on aging um uh and, and maybe the uh, veterans um organization you know might be able to uh you know, reach out to that sector of the, you know, sector of the population, but certainly the folks at the Council on Aging might have some good, um, some good contacts in that regard. Yeah, the veterans one is, that's a good suggestion. And Carol just works right down the hall from us. So uh, we'll, we'll reach out to her. Well, I think uh, Phil said uh, Council on Aging as well as veterans. I'm thinking uh, to just quickly piggyback on Phil, when you look at impacts of heat and uh, people who are, you know, it's hotter the further north you get uh, and people who can't escape heat because they don't have air conditioning. 
how, who are you, how are you going to find those people? I think Council on Aging Veteran Services are going to be able to, to put you in touch with those people. Uh, but I think the food bank might also be able to put you in touch with those people. I see Michael Sullivan and then Joseph. Michael. Yeah, I, I was just going to suggest that instead of trying to identify groups, we just try to find, try to identify who is going to be harmed by climate change. And what you just said, John, and what Phil's written up extensively in his uh, report is that people without money for AC. But, but I mean, I think that's the kind of brainstorm we got to do rather than, well, let's go back to the people without AC. Uh, you can add to your list the police and fire department because they, um, I think the police keep a, um, a check-in log on on folks that are more homebound and perhaps are have fewer resources. So that might be um, wh whoever it is, police or fire, maybe somebody knows, but they do keep a list and, and people get called every day. There's a, you know, some number of people get called every day because they are in their homes and yep. they, they might know who has AC or not. Yeah, good, very good thought, Michael. Uh, staying with you though, uh, if you look in the water thing, saltwater intrusion is there on wells, things like that. Are there uh, are there ways that you can think? I mean, that's something that's uh, going to be an impact. Are, is there a way to figure out who uh, well who might be impacted there? I'm going to guess that most of the people that are going to be impacted that live near the coast have have more, more means and are not they're not going to fall into one of these groups. That's that's my just well. I'm head. thinking uh, up in the Route Six area, uh, you get a lot of people on on wells, but you're right, uh, and they're not going to be subject to saltwater intrusion, though, are they? You're right. Okay. All right, uh, Joseph Inglesby, what are your thoughts? You spoke about farming, and certainly you could connect with the local Grange and also with CMAP. And I think that for the agricultural component of this, uh, uh, certainly members of the, uh, of the Resilience Committee could, could also uh, interview uh, whether the farmers, fishermen, shell fishermen, aquaculture people, uh, to bring it close to home. So, so I, I think that we could do some work internally as well. Okay, thank you, Jim Whiten. Uh, yeah, I have a couple of things. One, I think that uh, uh, a real estate lady that we have been in contact with about uh, the North Westport area, about uh, the homes of people that have no means and and um, apparently the northwest corner of Westport is one of the poorest areas on the south coast and I think that we could probably use her who and she is in contact with a lot of people up there and she could probably help us uh, identify those that are um, in the in the area of needing heat and air conditioning and stuff like that. Um, number two, uh, I was at the Serpent meeting last night and they talked about Westports being the first uh, of their communities to uh, do the MVP2. And uh, we had a presentation by Courtney Roca uh, last night. And uh, I just forwarded a, cop a PDF copy of that to Amy and Michael, and they could share it with the group if if uh, you so if you wanted that to see that. Uh, they mentioned that Sir, she mentioned that Serbid was recently approved as a subcontractor for this stuff, and I'm sure it's because the Westport um, signed up with Serbid to do this, and uh, I think. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention that may have some correlation is uh, last night uh, Serpid 
uh, announced that they were awarded a million dollar contract with the EPA for climate resilience. Uh, and I don't know the details of what they're going to be doing with that and uh, how it will affect Westport, but I'm sure that they're going to reach out to the communities to try to get programs to use up the, those funds. I noticed Lauren in the in the chat also mentioned uh, churches in the North End, Michael. So I see no other. Um, oh, Phil. Phil Weinberg's got his I, hand up. I just really quick to just follow up on that. Lauren, are there any any particular churches that have good reach um, in Northwestport? Lauren, you're uh, muted. Uh, I can think go. of two churches, um, the one on Highland Avenue. Um, and then there's one, the one on Sanford Road seemed to have a pretty active community. I mean, maybe you could reach out to someone. They could put it in their newsletter or something like that or announce it at church that the committee is looking for a representative from the region. And then perhaps sure. it will open up a conversation to some other maybe underserved people in their community. Great, yeah, um, that's that's a good suggestion, and and those churches are also in the environmental justice neighborhood of Westport, so we want to make sure that we have representative or representation from that area. So I guess this is a question for Michael that might lead to a suggestion, but I I don't know is is um, kind of cultural diversity part of what we need to be looking for so that we might see if there is like for example a portuguese yep. cultural society or whatever then i think you know we should you know try to reach out to that segment of the population that you know yeah absolutely um we the the point of the the program is to reach out to groups of folks who haven't traditionally been represented in processes like this um so yeah reaching out to the portuguese society that's a great suggestion all right uh kim you uh you have your hand up um thank you i was just thinking that you may be able to go through the schools and they could reach out to families that are um enrolled in the reduced lunch program Ooh, good idea yeah excellent thank you michael sullivan You're muted, Michael. I'm hey. sorry. Um, I was just clar trying to clarify. We're trying to find a broad and diverse range of citizens here that to, to get them involved in a process, not necessarily saying that they are particular victims of, of climate change. Is that a fair way to say that, Michael? Yeah, so we're trying to, I mean, there are two different cross-sections that we're trying to reach out to. It can be folks who haven't traditionally been represented, um, you know, and, and a planning process like this, as I said earlier, or it can be folks who might have, um, be from a community that may have particular vulnerabilities um, that will be disproportionately impacted by climate change. So uh, when we went to our kickoff meeting with them, they brought up an example of, you know, if if there's a community where there's a high incidence of persons with um, documented disabilities, their priorities um, in planning for climate change might be different than the towns in general. So they may, you know, know about a particular part of road that floods out and then they can't get the bus anymore and, you know, so really, we're really trying to tap into that local knowledge. All right, I want to take one more question uh, because we're 20 minutes in. So Dave Frogus, you got the last question. Great, thank you. Um, identifying the victim or the vulnerable is, you know, I, I think one approach um, and certainly an important one, but do we also want to think about um, 
sort of possible solutions. And what I mean by that is that Westport is uh, well known as a farming community. And it seems to me that if we, if we don't protect the farmers, uh, we're not going to have food to feed the vulnerable. And, and you know, so farms provide uh, work and they provide sustenance. And, um, you know, Westport's a right to farm community. Um, but I remember back from the COVID lockdowns that there were uh, complications with trying to sell meat locally because of, you know, uh, regulations or, or whatever. And I think that extended to not just meat, but uh, other things. Um, you know, don't we need to be thinking about the entire chain from the vulnerable up to the people who are going to help the vulnerable, which uh, is, you know, local farming? Yeah, absolutely. So we we do want to make sure that we're reaching out to the ag community. I think that's been a been a long standing, um, a long standing desire to have our ag community more involved um, in our our climate planning. Um, so yes, that's that's a group that we'll be reaching out to as well. Okay, and so you know they're going to have uh, water requirements. They're going to have regulation relief requirements. They're going to have you know, other kinds of requirements. Is it upon this group to not only identify the vulnerable, but also to help uh, fortify uh, future possible solutions and protect those solutions, make sure that our farmers don't all get put out of business? I think the, the piece about making sure that the farmers aren't put out of business will probably be a little bit beyond the scope of this this grant program so we're taking a look at we're, we're assembling this team in order to take a look at the previous mvp that was produced a, a couple of years ago and to ask that core team are these uh, identified vulnerabilities the correct ones um were we off the mark um, are there additional things that we should identify that weren't talked about in that process? Okay, well, when, you know, I, I, what is it, the Santos farm that was recently developed on the, would that be the north side of Main Street, where there are a bunch of, you know, nice big houses there? I mean, that's, that's always sad for me to drive past, uh, you know. Um, I, I'm wondering if the right to farm doesn't also include some moral obligation to protect the land from uh, development. And, um, you know, uh, we, we see our farmland disappear. It'd be great if Westport were all, you know, summer residents and uh, no farming. I mean, where, where are we then, right? Um, so I, I don't think that's the right mix. I think it's incumbent on us to participate in, um, uh, you know, a comprehensive review of land use and protecting our farmers and uh, making sure that we have sustainability uh, throughout the whole. I, I think uh, we're getting off the topic that Michael started on and into committee reports. So why don't we, uh, uh, that's a good uh, topic for the ag report. Uh, so why don't we uh, rejoin that topic, David, as we get into committee reports. And as I said, that was the last question. So Joseph and Michael, uh, you're too late. Um, we're into committee reports now. Uh, and engagement and fundraising, Jeff Canton is not with us. Um, and uh, nor is David Cole. Now, I think there are some other members of the engagement committee. Jeff did leave a couple of uh, uh, questions uh, that we are going to discuss under item five, uh, promoting further uh, progression in uh, subcommittee reports and available tools to help visualize. So we will get to some things that Jeff wanted discussed and Amy is going to take notes about our discussion and get them back to Jeff. Uh, are there, I think uh, Sean is on that committee. Are there other members of the committee that want to uh, give uh, a, a report for the engagement and fundraising committee. If not, we'll just move on and pick up what Jeff left us under item five. 
Okay, hearing nothing. Uh, uh, water. Uh, water met yesterday, very active meeting. Uh, and so, uh, Michael Sullivan. Thank you, John. Um, as John mentioned, we had a meeting yesterday. We've been meeting about every couple of months or so. The main purpose of our meetings is to compile a report, a report that's basically our perspective on where we stand with vulnerabilities in Westport that are generated by uh, global warming and climate change. And um, kind of broken it down a little bit, but um, but the reports, I don't know, it's probably 80%, 90% done. We hope to hope to finish the, a draft uh, in a month. And at the following meeting, which will be two months from now ahead of our meeting with this group, we hope to have a, um, a report submitted to, you know, to the larger group here. Basically, we, you know, we, we've identified six or seven risks to Westport. You know, whether that, you know, for example, um, sea level rise and properties that are um, both, you know, private and public uh, um, infrastructure that's on the water, if you will. And it's, it's increasing vulnerability to that. Um, and we have some suggestions in some cases. A lot of cases we don't have any answers yet. We just have questions. So um, each of these problems comes along with hey, we should, we should look into this, or maybe we should try this or study that. Um, but that's the structure of it. And um, I guess, like I said, within two months, we hope to have a, a report for the, for the larger committee. And, and as we talked last night, it's, it's, you know, this is a kind of a permanent committee. This problem is not gonna be solved in our lifetimes. So this subcommittee, this water subcommittee, We'd like to keep this document up as the knowledge, as the you know news and knowledge changes, and it almost acts as an orientation document for people joining, uh, joining the committee, so they don't have to spend a lot of time catching up. So, so that's where we are. Um, and I, I mentioned last night, John, the water committee. I spent spent the day on the water today. I spent this morning. We went out to Gooseberry to um, help with. Uh, some of the measurements out there. We found our device that we were looking for. We had to dive down and find it. It was uh, a little bit of a challenge, but we were successful. And um, David, you'll be glad to know that we were able to download the data and now we got to go find the other one. So um, so we have some active programs going on right now, both with Buzzards Bay Coalition and the Watershed to try to look at some of these problems. So when, when Michael says he's on the water, sometimes he's on the water, sometimes he's under the water. He, yeah. I mean, he's he's immersive and he's immersed in this subject, literally. Um, and I, I think that uh, the report that uh, Michael is leading us on uh, changes on a day-to-day -day basis because uh, there are about, I don't know, 15 members of this subcommittee, and they're all active in taking pieces of the report. And, um, uh, and as every member of this subcommittee uh, updates their, their sections, Michael compiles it, and it, you know, it changes every day. But, uh, Michael, you could take uh, whatever the current version of the report and send it to Michael Burris. And if any chair of another subcommittee, historic structures or agriculture wanted to see it to just get an idea of, you know, layout and format and, you know, how does it read? I'm sure Michael Burris could then send it to that uh, subcommittee chair to say, okay, what does the water subcommittee report look like? Uh, uh, because, you know, how's it laid out and, and so on, just as an example, because as you said, Michael, it's about 80, 90% done. Uh, so thank you for your leadership on that. Uh, infrastructure and safety, uh, Bob Daler was over in England because his wife is rowing with Dharma 
I don't think she rode the Dharma all the way over to England, but I think she had a race in England. Uh, uh, and I don't think they're back yet. Uh, so uh, unless someone else is on that committee, I don't think we have a report on infrastructure t today. Is that correct? I don't see any hands raised for infrastructure. So we'll pass on that. We have several members of the health uh, subcommittee. Phil, uh, I think. Uh, yeah, Donna so here. I will. So um, I will speak for that. So I just happened to check out of curiosity, and it was June of 2022 that I submitted my report. And um, and so and I've also been working, you know, on the water committee. And um, so I think that you know, the health committee has been, as a committee, quiescent uh, during this, during the period. And uh, and so I think we should probably regroup and have uh, a look as to whether or not we want to update the report. Um, and so I think try to do that in the timeline that um, that you, John, and uh, and Michael have suggested. I do think that the point that you raised about um, the format and the content uh, or the way the information is presented or what even what information is presented across all the reports is um, is something that probably needs to get looked at because I think there's a lot of you know basic information in each report that would probably be repeated eight or nine times. And uh, and I, we haven't really decided, I don't think, as an overall committee, um, you know, how we're gonna um, compile and present this in a single report. But I think that there should be a phase of that if we are actually looking to create one report that some of the big picture um, information, you know, like how heat has risen over the last several decades, you know, doesn't need to be re referenced in every report, for example. So um, I don't know if there's a, be a process set up for that. Um, and maybe the chairs of the committee get together and kind of look at each other's reports and figure that out. But at least for the health committee, I think we're gonna try to get together, see if we wanna update our report um, based on topics that have come up during the year. And if I might say one more thing related to heat and um, infectious diseases spreading, in case you didn't get the report, West Nile virus has been found in mosquitoes in Westport. And so please, you know, be conscious of that in um, when you go out at times when mosquitoes mm -hmm or in places where mosquitoes are likely to congregate, please, um, you know, get insect repellent and uh, take care of yourselves. Uh, thank you, Phil, very much. And uh, a couple of quick things. Uh, one, I do want to talk about the topic of how uh, these subcommittee reports merge. We had a little discussion yesterday, as you know, Phil, in the water committee. Uh, but I want to do that under item five uh, after we've uh, completed the subcommittee reports. So uh, I know there's some hands raised. Uh, if, if you want to talk about how we merge the reports, let's hold off on that until uh, item five, and then let's talk about that. Uh, uh, and so uh, I do see uh, hands raised uh, from uh, Michael Sullivan, Michael uh, Yagman, and Donna Amaral. So uh, Mike Sullivan. Yeah, I just wanted to quickly give uh, Phil and Donna and the health committee credit because they got their report out last year, which kind of inspired us to, you know, to do the same thing. So thank you, Phil. Okay, uh, Mike Yagman. Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, uh think that maybe, Phil, we should reach out to the uh, high school students again uh, to see if uh, uh, any of their concerns about anxiety about climate change. And I know Donna had uh, 
uh, something she sent me the other day that can uh, speak to that. So I uh, just wanted to queue up Donna. Okay, Donna. Well, thank you, Michael, for queuing me up. Um, so I, I, this actually has more to do with um, how to engage. Um, but if anyone subscribes to um, the National Geographic, they have a 2024 slingshot challenge, which is about climate change. And they ask students from the age of 13 to 18 years old to create a one minute video about how they would describe an idea to solve the environmental issues. Um, and they, once they register, then they get help from the National Geographic um, staff to sort of formulate what their plan would be. Um, and then there's a prize, it's $1,000 to $10,000 to take it further. So um, I sent that information to the science teacher, um, Jace, I think it's Jason, Jordan, Jordan uh, Silva, and um, to one of the uh, counselors that I keep in contact with to hopefully inspire them to do it. But I was also thinking on another level for those in engagement that maybe we could set something up as well to encourage that, the participation in that, and then have them focus on something in Westport and then help them implement the, the process of improvement. So I, it was just taking a little bit further, but, um, but I think that that National Geographic Slingshot Challenge is a great place for us to connect young people into the CRC. And the CRC maybe even could sponsor something like that, where whoever did a um, video that we would present an award of some kind. I don't know what, but um, I just think it's a great way to engage the kids. And and what I had raised my hand about um, regarding what Phil said and what health, I think that we're all aware as well that because of climate change, malaria is... Um, uh, is moving up into the United States as well. So climate change and health, we're seeing uh, these uh, uh, insect vector-borne diseases coming further up into uh, the United States as well. Um, so, um, but that's that's what I had to say. I just wanted to add on to Phil. Uh, Michael gave me that segue to bring up the National Geographic Slingshot Challenge. Thank you. Uh, that is uh, really fascinating. That. Uh, thank you for pointing that out. And Amy, if you would uh, uh, make note of the slingshot challenge for uh, the note and include those in the notes you were taking for Jeff Canton in the engagement committee uh, so that he gets uh, that idea. Uh, uh, because I, I think uh, that is a, a very cool idea for uh all the engagement suggestions that pertain to the schools. Uh, okay, thank you, uh, Health Committee. Uh, agriculture um, is, uh, we've had some exciting developments with agriculture and we've got both uh, Ray Raposa and Joseph Inglesby. And we also have um, an 11 page uh, draft report. Uh, it was like a two-page draft report. Then it turned into a five-page draft report. Then it turned into an 11-page draft report uh, because of Joseph Inglesby. Tomorrow, it's going to be a 15-page draft report. Uh, then, you know, over the weekend, it's going to be a 22-page draft report. Joseph is going like a madman here. Uh, it, it's it, very exciting to watch what is happening in the agriculture subcommittee. So I don't know whether Ray or Joe wants to start this off, but um, the ag subcommittee's on fire. <laughs> if you don't, uh, okay. If, uh, what I'd like to, I don't have a report and I'm, I'm gonna allow Joe to give it because he's done 100% of the work. Uh, but I do have some a few things to say about some of the topics we've touched on today. Uh, support. There's a lot of support from outside of Westport for farmers. As far as the uh, USDA uh, seed companies uh, with new technology on uh, genetically modified seeds that'll grow in 
warmer climate or weather wetter climate. As far as water goes, uh, I, I think the uh, key will be water for vegetable growers. Uh, there's there will be support coming on irrigation. I, I think in the future the vegetable growers. I think smaller farms are going to be the future in Westport, not larger farms. Uh, there'll be some water for cattle growers. I know of some farmers that have uh, applied for grants uh, for rotational grazing uh, to clean up the, the water uh, flow that gets into the rivers uh, and into the ponds. Uh, there's a lot of money available for that. I think, John, you touched on heat, dairy cows. That's a technology that's uh, been in the process for decades now with fans uh, getting the dairy cows into the uh, shade. But I, I, unfortunately, I think dairying in Westport is uh, uh, not what it used to be. And uh, I think that that's uh, all taken care of. As far as the subject on what Mike Sullivan touched on, the land, uh, Santos's land slipped through our fingers. Uh, that was, uh, it was no one's fault, but I, I'm not sure the land trust was was well prepared for what took place there. Uh, it's it's spilt milk, but it's no one's fault. It's unfortunate to see the houses there. That was pretty prime land, according to, um, you'll see the maps, if we've all seen that Joe has uh, sent out to us. But the real report is, is the work Joe has really done everything for the uh, uh, Ag Committee, and, and I'd like to turn it over to Joe. Joseph, you're on. Thank you, Ray. Um, but I think 50% of the of this work, uh, we can thank Michael Boris, uh, who's been very supportive, uh, working on the mapping and and uh, bringing it to fruition. So thank you, Michael. Um, you know, Westport, as I mentioned, has been blessed. It has uh, moderate temperatures, has favorable soils, and over the years, it's it's uh, developed into a, a right to farm community uh, and uh, with crops that are somewhat unique to Westport, including the Macumber turnip. Uh, they've, uh, the uh, Russell family has grown up the grapes. So they started with a, uh, a white uh, a grape that was turned into a wonderful sparkling wine. Well, now with warming temperatures, what we're finding is that they're able to grow the, the red grapes for uh, sherries and for uh, other other uh, burgundy and other other red wines, which is a change, it's a shift uh, that you're finding, and uh, the farmers are are also shifting in terms of their abilities to survive in in a, a changing climate. Uh, that is to uh, produce other products uh, from the main product. So of course. Uh, uh, from grapes, you have the wines. From the apples, you have uh, uh, apple cider and and hard cider, uh, which uh, the Russell family is also producing. Uh, from dairy milk, you have the cheeses and you have the yogurts, and also the change of venues, where there are weddings and and uh, other uh, markets, open markets, uh, and events are are being proposed and and uh, and happening to allow the farmers to uh, survive economically. Uh, but that is in question, as uh, uh, one of the members here mentioned, uh, how can we make uh, it uh, farming and agriculture and how can uh, uh, survive in, in, a, in a changing climate? So uh, what I'm suggesting is that we as a committee start looking at uh, uh, the farmers who are doing seasonal crops, how they're they're um, uh, dealing with the seasonal changes, whether through hoop houses, greenhouses, changes in in types of crops that they're growing, um, how the vineyards are changing, the orchards are changing, um, and uh, with the dairy market, uh, that's that's a real question. I think uh, mention was made of of uh, shading the cows and. Uh, the productivity and economic ability of the dairy farmers to survive with the beef, uh, beef uh, uh, livestock uh, with beef, uh, you have the meat products are being produced that I think is 
continuing to be a profitable um, and economically and cl climate uh, adaptable uh, industry, but uh, it relies on hay and alfalfa, which is uh, climate dependent. So this past year, with the extended rainfall, uh, you know, I mentioned you know, the report, make hay while the sun shines is a case in point. Uh, the reduced hay uh, production you know, is going to increase the prices of, uh, of raising uh, farm animals, livestock. Uh, uh, and I think that that is probably reflected in the numbers for this year. Um, I'd also take, like to take a look at uh, shell fishing, uh, whether the bay scallops, the quahogs, the surf clams that had been a major industry at one time in Westport, um, and aquaculture with the oysters. Um, uh, for fishing, um, I contacted Brad Chase, uh, who's the, the uh, marine ecologist for Division of Marine Fisheries, and also looked at the Buzzards Bay Coalition State of the Bay report for 2022. And what we found and what has been documented is there's been a crash in the river herring populations. Uh, what caused the crash? Uh, could it be overfishing with the Menhaden uh, population at sea? Uh, could it be uh, changes in water temperatures, blockages with dams and uh, uh, non-functional uh, herring runs, for example, fish runs. Um, but I think that that is an interesting element of that. Also in Westport, uh, we have cold water uh, uh, trout, from what I understand, and there's been some protection that's been uh, placed on those streams and surrounding uh, buffered buffer zones along the streams uh, uh, that I think could be expanded so that you have a contiguous uh, protection, uh, shaded protection for these very climate vulnerable fish, uh, which cannot tolerate warm water. Um, so those are a few of the, the elements that we're looking at on that. But uh, I think if you're going to look at this, and we've looked at it from a land use perspective, uh, looking at the soils, uh, agricultural soils, uh, vulnerable soils um, in, in Westport, and I think that this is to look at a climate change um, effects on agriculture. You have to look at, at the totality. You have to look at the hydrology. You have to look at the, the soils. You have to look at the vegetation and uh, uh, temperature fluctuations. And uh, so uh, Michael's GIS uh, mapping helps to show uh, soils uh, in Westport that are very specific to prime, uh, prime soils for agriculture uh, that are both local, statewide, and unique. Uh, I think that if the, in terms of long-term planning for the time, if uh, the planning board and others could take a, a look and incorporate um, hydrology and the uh, soils data into their long-term planning, uh, that would have it so that uh, properties like the Santos uh, uh, farm subdivisions don't happen. But, you know, it's easy to build on cleared and leveled land, and that's what builders do. Uh, and that's what they've done historically in Westport, whether it's Route 88, uh, uh, bisecting farms, or the subdivisions that came off it, it's, it's easy. But now, that people are have a different set of of uh, uh, awareness, I guess, on this. Maybe in future um, it would be considered so uh, that you you because in terms of long term farming in in Westport um, and in surrounding communities on the south coast, um, you're going to be having some changes in terms of transportation of uh, out-of-state crops, for example, that's going to be more expensive. Uh, you're going to find that some areas that had been great producers, such as Florida, California, may no, no, may no longer, Arizona, may no longer be uh, a great suppliers in future. So you have to look locally. And that's, that's why I think it's important to uh, think local 
and uh, buy local. And uh, if Westport is to re is to remain uh, a right to farm community. So those are a few thoughts. Lots to do. I'd like to add, I'd like to add to that if I could, because uh, Joe's done quite a bit of work. As far as the uh, uh, the problem we had with COVID, where uh, the the uh, shelves were had no no beef or meat on them, uh, we had worked with Meatworks uh, with getting uh, more meat processed at the time, uh, and we continue to work with Meatworks on they're supplying some meats to the schools locally. Um, they've been a, a real asset. Uh, to that part of the uh, agricultural uh, community. I'd also like to say that uh, uh, farmers have really been resilient for uh, 100 years or more. They continue to change with the times, uh, coming up with, with new crops, different crops. Uh, 40 years ago, soybeans were not grown in the Northeast, uh, not, not in upstate New York or Canada. Now, uh, 40 years later, uh, with uh, genetically modified crops, soybeans are grown in the Northeast where they hadn't been. Uh, so that's all continuing research. I don't see that stopping at all. Uh, the grain companies are doing research into uh, what affects the cattle, uh, how they put extra extra weight on, it has to do with fly control. Uh, so there are studies there. Uh, I would like to say that because of the wetness this year, there's been a bumper crop of hay. Uh, so the uh, the moisture hasn't slowed that down at all. And I would like to say uh, about Joe's maps, about the prime soils. It looks like on the maps that the, the prime soils are all the open and tilled fields. Uh, it's called tillable land. Uh, the soils that are important to Massachusetts, which aren't tillable, are the same type of soils uh, that, that are wooded, that could be cropland in the future, which would be very expensive. But uh, there's still a lot of work to do, I'm sure. Uh, no one has a crystal ball as to what's going to happen 50, 60, 70 years from now. But it's something we, we'll all have to work on with the, uh, sub, the Ag Subcommittee this winter. I haven't been active at all, and it's all on me, but it's something we, we should get together and do. We tried to have a, an in-person meeting. Uh, that didn't work. It was just uh, John Bullitt and I, and we really didn't have much to say to each other other than uh, the news of the day. Uh, so it's something that we should uh, work on in the winter uh, when the, the nights are longer and the days are shorter. John, your, mic, your mic's off. Uh, before I get to Jim, who's got his hand up, uh, thank you both, uh, Ray and uh, J Joseph and Michael Burris for uh, uh, the, yeah, <laughs> David Sprogas has got clapping hands going up uh, for uh, this work and for uh, uh, the report to date, uh, because it, it's really showing tremendous promise. And one of the takeaways I get from it is if you look at agriculture in Westport and and Ray said both Ray and Joseph said this and and comparing it to the way agriculture is conducted in Iowa or, or Nebraska, uh, we have some advantages. Small is beautiful, right? Why is small beautiful? Because uh, everything is changing now, and when you're small, you're nimble and you can change. Um, and value added is beautiful, right? You don't want to sell milk, you want to sell cheese and ice cream. You don't want to sell berries, you want to sell jam and you want to sell wine. And that's what uh, people are doing now, is they're, they're realizing uh, the advantages that we have here in Westport, and they're taking advantage of that. So, Jim White, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to speak about, uh, for instance, uh, uh, Joseph mentioned what happened with the Santos farm. Uh, the Santos farm across the street was preserved. The Santos farm, where all the houses are, 
was developed as an uh, approval not required. So what that is in the in the state of Massachusetts is if you have frontage and area along a way in existence, you can subdivide the land without calling it a subdivision. And it can't be uh, regulated in any way. You know, the planning board has no authority to approve or disapprove it. All they do is endorse it. And that we need legislative change to be able to change that law because in Westport, all we have is empty frontage on main roads and most of it is agricultural. And if we don't do anything, it'll all turn into houses uh, because the, the, unless the land trust has enough money to buy it up every time, uh, it's going to be a real, a real problem. Uh, and to rezone the agricultural land as not suitable for housing, uh, we've had pushback from the agricultural community or farmers in general that, what do you mean we can't sell it for subdivision? That's my retirement. And so I, I think we have to rethink how this whole process works. Uh, right now we have a piece of land uh, next to a big parcel that Westport owns off of Drift Road that is, is we have an application that we're going to hear at the end of October for a nine lot subdivision. And this land had previously been in Chapter 61A, the, the tax relief project for agricultural land, but uh, it was released by the select board a year ago year and a half ago so the town has no way of preventing it and the owner who bought it uh, after it was uh, the 61a was released um, the, the people who have it want to maximize the money out of the land it would have been a great thing to combine with the town property which is about the same size and it's one of the only areas of farmland in that section of Drift Road, but um, we have no authority to disapprove it. Uh, all we can do is, is condition it, and that's not going to help. So I just wanted to throw that out. I mean, it's a big issue, and I appreciate what Joe has done. Or, I'm sorry, Joseph has done um, with this mapping and Michael. It's all really, really, really neat, but uh, if we can figure out how other people are dealing with the soil issues vis-a-vis -vis development, I'd like to hear because I don't see how we can do anything about it. All right. We've got two other hands, Ray and then Michael Burris. Uh, I'd like to touch on uh, what Jim was saying about uh, legislation. <laughs> uh, uh, Paul Schmidt is the chair of the ag committee the first ag committee for this for mdal or the state of massachusetts right and it's he would be someone that we should hook on to to see what can be done with the legislators those are the people who uh, can change the laws uh so i would say it's something that needs to be worked on with paul schmidt and the committee that he he heads michael burris Yes, and Jim, and in terms of solutions, I think we can look into our uh, backyard here in New England and, and look at Vermont. Uh, the state of Vermont is, is really, it's very protective of its working agricultural lands and, and, and forests. Um, I used to work up in Vermont, and they have a pretty uh, restrictive, um, a pretty restrictive program of uh, agricultural impact fees or ag soil impact fees. Um, in, in areas where there's prime and statewide soils. I don't know if this is something that we could incorporate on a local basis, um, and if it's not something that would be legal in the state of Massachusetts, I think, you know, as Ray was saying, this is something that could be explored with our, our legislators. All right. Uh, well, as one of the co-founders of CMAP, the whole idea of CMAP was uh, you want to make it possible for farms to exist economically uh, so that you don't need 
uh, the uh, Westport Conservation Trust to have to buy uh, the Santos farm. Uh, I mean, they did a heroic job. They couldn't buy both sides of Main Road. They could only buy one side of Main Road. Then they wrote down the cost, and that's why it, half of uh, Main Road is still in farming. Uh, but, you know, the, the whole purpose of CMAP was to work with farmers so that they can develop business models where they stay economically viable so that a farm doesn't have to grow a last crop of houses uh, because farms are not, you know, nonprofit organizations. They have to make money and they, they run into problems where the next generation doesn't always want to continue in the business. Okay, we're, thank you, Joseph. Thank you, Ray, very much. What a great encouraging report from agriculture. Uh, I don't see either, oh, uh, Sean Leach is here, I think. Uh, there are three members of the Historic Structures Subcommittee, Kit Wise, Wendy Nicholas, and Sean Leach. Uh, have you guys met Sean? Uh, has that committee met Sean, do you know? Uh, Sean's on mute. I don't know whether he's uh, listening to us or not. I haven't heard that they have met yet. John, we've not posted any agendas, um, so I don't know if they've met with each other at different points, but they've not had an official meeting yet. Okay. All right. Well, we'll assume that they have not yet met. They have a pretty narrow uh, mission, so uh, and they have a lot of firepower there, so they should uh, be able to get a report done when everybody else is due. So mm -hmm. let's move to item five. John, yeah. I, I can actually report on a little bit for the Historic Structure Subcommittee. So I did prepare a map for them. Oh, you uh, did? Yeah, that shows uh, structures that are um, structures that are designated as historical in Westport in relation to uh, the, the regulatory floodway. Um, yep. so for those, I can circulate that after this meeting for everyone that's curious to take a look at that. Because that was kind of step one. So right. step, step one's been done. Great. Okay. Now, uh, before uh, discussing the items on progression of subcommittee reports, um, which involves kind of a timeline for the reports. Uh, let me just throw out the, our next meeting date. We have been on a, uh, a Thursday uh, meeting date. Uh, we did have a question five o'clock or six o'clock. We sent out a poll. It was like 80% of the people preferred five o'clock. So we're going to stay with five o'clock. And uh, every other month so that the subcommittees could meet in the intervening month. So every other month would be uh, the end of uh, November, like no, uh, you don't want to do Thanksgiving and uh, November 30th, I have to do a book reading. So I'm thinking of December uh, 7th. Uh, is, is that all right as a next meeting for us. If, if uh, anyone ha has. I, I mean, it, it's, I'm, I'll miss because I have a, a five o'clock board meeting and anybody that's on the, the board at, at Watershed will miss too, but but don't don't change it for me. It's. Um, no, no, okay. It works for me. So. Trying to think. Um, how far out I could go here. Um, how about Thursday the 14th? Okay. Want to do that? Sounds good to me. December 14th? Yeah. 
Yep, that works. All right. Because it's going to be sometime, you know, between uh, Thanksgiving and the kind of Christmas, Hanukkah, New Year's holiday anyway. So let's do the uh, uh, Thursday the 14th. Now, so I wanted to establish this is when we're meeting because I figured there'd be one meeting between now and New Year's. And then uh, there'd be another meeting, say, two months from that, you know, in the February time frame. Uh, and that that gives every subcommittee uh, between now and the end of December uh, a time to meet. Uh, and so I'm thinking about what is, in, in terms of promoting further progression of subcommittee reports, uh, what we talked about uh, last night at the Water Committee is uh, what's the best progression for public input and the steps of uh, the process of how a committee report happens. And let me just run by what we discussed last night at the Water Committee and see what people think about this as an order. And what the Water Committee thought made sense is that the subcommittees would draft their reports. So Water would draft its report, Ag would draft its report, everyone drafts their reports. And we'd encourage you know, a deadline. Maybe it's uh, March 1st, whatever. February 15th, pick a deadline. Uh, and uh, it might be the uh, end of February meeting of the CRC. Uh, and uh, then the CRC would receive all the reports. So that's... Uh, 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 water, infrastructure, health, agriculture, uh, historic structures. So that's five reports. Uh, and then uh, we have to bundle them together. And that might take uh, some staff time on the planning department because uh, they're all going to be written differently. Uh, I and we've got to put an introduction together and some other stuff so that it's one report and we've got to decide is it okay that they are formatted differently or do we want to have them have a similar format which would take uh, some real jiggering editorially but however we decide to do that, they get combined into one report, which becomes the CRC report. Then, because we were chartered by the Board of Selectmen, sorry, the Select Board, uh, we then present that to the Select Board and say, uh, you all chartered us. Here's a report for you to look at. And if you think this report is okay, then it would be our intention to take this report out to the public uh, and uh, uh, see what the public thinks about it. And uh, then bring it back to the CRC with public reaction. And based on that public reaction, make changes to the report. Now, uh, this report should have information about what is climate change and what are the risks or drivers, whatever terminology we want to use, that it presents to the Westport as a town and the people of Westport as individuals. And then uh, 
what do we recommend uh, people should uh, uh, do with that information? As Dave Sproga said uh, last night, I'm hoping I'm uh, capturing your thought on this, Dave. Um, there should be policy recommendations for the town or uh, let's just say government. You know, the town government should do these things. If you're talking about infrastructure, for example, roads should be raised, whatever, things like that. That's government policies. But there should also be recommendations for what individuals should do uh, or private entities should do. Uh, and uh, I used to say when I uh, uh, was president of C Education Association, um, ask two questions, what's going on here and what do I do about it? So uh, we, we talked um, about uh, last night, you know, if there's not going to be, if it's going to be hard to get insurance, then uh, you should have a discussion with your insurance. You know, that's a private thing. If uh, we, we just were talking about agriculture and farmers, uh, this is, we're giving you the way this agriculture report is going, a lot of really good information about farming. But uh, as Ray said, we're not calling for more regulations for farmers. We're trying to give farmers good information so that they can act on that information. We're not telling them what to do. We're saying, here's information. If you want to use that to do something, use it. Uh, but it's not a public policy. It's something that a farmer, once a farmer has that information, can decide, well, I think I might change from this crop to that crop, you know, because th that crop might be more resilient to higher temperatures. So thank you for writing this report. This gives me good information. I'm going to change from this crop to that crop, not because I'm being ordered to, but because I now have this new information. So there'd be two types of policies, public policies and private uh, recommendations. Dave said, you know, a person can paint their driveway white because it reflects heat. You know, that's something you can do if you want to do, but we're not telling you you have to do it, that kind of stuff. So uh, every report would have those two types of recommendations in it, uh, but it would have the underlying science and uh, 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 that lead to those recommendations. So is does that make sense as a sequence? That is... We say we'd like these reports into the CRC. I'm just saying February, March timetable. And then we'd spend some time merging those documents into one document. And then uh, that might take a couple of months. And that might be a staff load, Michael, on the planning department to help us do that. And then after they're merged into one document, which the, all the members of the CRC would take a look at and say, yep, we like the way that's now looks like one report. And uh, e even if it has some format changes, Mike Sullivan, you know, and how water is done so that it's one document instead of, you know, that we still think it looks like one good report, then we as a as a CRC would take it to the uh, Board of Selectmen and say, before we go to the public, we want the Board of Selectmen's blessing. That makes sense as a, as a kind of way to go forward on this. What do you all think? 
Uh, Joseph Inglesby's got his hand up and then Jim White. Joseph. Well, if you consider this to be like uh, publishing a book with different authors, you know, you would have a template that the authors would work with uh, that would give you the format, would tell you the uh, the point size, everything from the point size to the character to uh, uh, to the different categories that you want approached. So if you want some conformity on on this, I think by providing a format that would would help us in that way, you know, what is the, uh, how do you want to have you a, a narrative? You, you spoke about public and recommendations of public policies and private recommendations, you know, uh, how would you like it to be uh, uh, assembled uh, from each committee, you know, so that there'll be continuity, so it won't put a burden on town hall, um, uh, Michael and, uh, and company to try and reformat all of these. All right, good suggestion, Jim White. You're muted. You're on mute, Jim. <clears throat> I think each each uh, subcommittee is going to have a different take on what 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 the report is going to look like because of the specifics of their of their charge. For instance, in the infrastructure committee, uh, they might uh, come up with things that we ought to think about planning to do in the next 10 years, things that are in a 10 to 20 or 30 year horizon and things that are in a 50 year horizon. And these are the things that we are, we're thinking about today uh, that we need, need, need to do in these horizon areas where for health and farming, I don't think you have those horizon things. You just have an overall a general uh, idea of how climate change is going to affect uh, that sector and what are the things we need to think about. Uh, I don't think it has a time frame. And I don't think personally that we need to give it to the select board until we're done with the public process. All right. Thank you, David Sprogus. Yeah, thank you. I, I agree with Jim. I, I think that um, um, the demands of each uh, different area uh, could pull uh, the formatting requirements in different dimensions, um, and we won't know until they're all together. But uh, my, my comment goes to process. Um, and whereas the consumers of the report that we produce are likely to want to use it for secondary conversations around relief for regulations or or you know legislation to support this or that or you know whatever i think we i think there needs to be a formal process we can't just produce a report and and say we're we're done it's it's almost like it needs to be ratified by the public or ratified by the elected officials who say, yeah, we've read this. We think that it represents the interests of the residents of Watertown and we ratify it or we, you know, it, it, um, we, we, I don't know what the right words are, but we make, we make it a statement that we're willing to back so that when those secondary conversations happen, and reference the report that we created, you know, they, they, they say, hey, you, you did this report, you said this about water, you said this about land, and because of that, you know, here's my hardship or here's my ask or whatever, if, if it's going to be the basis for those secondary actions, I think there's, there's a ratification process that has to happen. Well, uh, uh, David, you, uh, you mean Westport, but not Watertown. But are you saying it should go to the Board of Selectmen before it goes to the uh, public? Is that what you're meaning? I I don't know. I don't know what the right process is. Um, it's just before be, before the before it becomes set in stone, um, it needs to be adopted, and, and and so either the selectmen 
or the community needs to say, yes, we've read it, we agree with it. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, okay. Uh, Michael Sullivan, then Jim Whiten again. Thank you, John. Um, yeah, I, mean, I think you've got six uh, experiments incubating right now, John, and you should see what comes out of that. Um, it, it will be interactive process. I'm sure we'll pick up a lot from other committees and they may pick up something from us. But I, I think you, this conversation might be better had as far as the formatting uh, and the assembly of a final report. This conversation might be better had once we've all submitted and reviewed the individual reports. As far as the public process is concerned, you know, we have uh, Sean on, online and you, you really need to consult with the Board of Selectmen about, you know, hey, here's where we are. Here's what we think the next steps are. What do you think? I mean, I don't, I don't think it's for us to decide to conduct public hearings on a report until we consult with them. That, that'd be my, my input. Uh, before I go back to Jim White and Shauna, are you uh, uh, with us here? I am. Yeah. Um, so, you, um, go ahead. I, I think I think what this committee needs to do is present it to the select board, right? So it's presented to the select board and give an opportunity. I don't know that I don't know that we have really a history of like ratifying documents or something like that, but I think that the result should be presented to the select board. And I agree, probably before it starts getting used in a widespread way. So uh, go to the select board before going out to the public. I would no, um, I. Um, you're getting public input all along the way of the creation of the document, right? So I yeah. actually, I, I actually don't mind it going to the public conference. You, you have more of an opportunity to speak in more detail with the public at a separate meeting, not at a select board meeting. So I don't really care one way or the other about where the public input happens. Whether, in fact, it probably should happen before the select board. But I'm just talking about before we start using it, like. Um, if we're submitting grant applications and stuff like that, then maybe just present it to the select board first. But I think I think getting public comment on it before it goes to the select board is probably fine. Okay. Well, there's no question we want to go to the public in probably more than one meeting yeah. uh, uh, before it becomes a, quote, final document that we're using for grants or other things like that. Uh, the the question in my mind is would we want to show it to the select board before having uh, several public meetings actually now that i'm thinking about it again um i think actually probably like a checkpoint with the select board is probably overdue like i think i think it would be good to have like a check-in with the select board yeah. to talk about the fact that you're going to go out to public comment so like it should have the draft and then talk about yeah. it i think that's probably a better way to do it yeah that's what i was thinking yeah. because i uh, once we go out to public meetings it's you know it's it's a big deal and you would have had a chance to see it and yeah. uh you're not going to be taken by surprise. What? What? You guys went out there and a hundred people looked at this document. We didn't even see that kind of. I, I don't want that kind of reaction. Yeah. All right. Uh, we've got uh, uh, Jim White and Phil Weinberg and Michael Burris. Okay. I just wanted to put my opinion is that we should never think that this is uh, set in stone. Right. That it's a living document. It is never intended to be the final say. It's always going to be updated every year as we see what's happening. As long as that does not mean, John Bullard, you are chairman for the rest of your living days. You are. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Phil. Well, I, I, I do think that um, there is a basic format that I think we all have been working with at least, and I, I feel that in the water committee and in, and in the health committee, and, I, and I, I think it applies in which we are first trying to educate or um, provide an overview, right, of what are the um 
what are going to be the consequences, not, not the consequences, but, you know, what are the facts of that we know about of what is going to happen with climate change? You know, what's going to happen with temperature? What's going to happen with precipitation? You know, what does the future look like? And then everyone, I think, in their own way is talking about what are the risks that are associated with that? And then, you know, what, what, are, the, what are the responses? And then maybe get to how we want to prioritize that. And maybe that's part of the public, of the public process. So I do think that there's an overall framework of how we would talk about here's the problem, you know, here are the conditions, here's the problems that they're going to create. Here are um, some, you know, potential responses that we could have, and then getting into, um, you know, well, how would we rank those in terms of uh, what we want to, you know, what what we want to start with. So I, 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 to me, that is kind of the natural framework. Um, I kind of support the idea of, you know, going to the select board and and getting their feedback about that. Um, as I mentioned in the public, you know, at the water committee, just coming out of my experience with putting together, um, you know, the integrated, uh, you know, water management plan, that it was really helpful to have the benefit of a consultant who had run a lot of those processes, um, you know, to lead the discussion, to be able to pull together, you know, the comments and to provide kind of a sounding board back for the committee, um, you, you know, uh, to kind of synthesize what, you know, what they've, you know, what they've heard and also bring to that the experience that they would bring to the table of here's what other communities have done. Here's what's worked in, you know, in other places on similar topics. So, um, uh, I, I think at some point when we get to that point, we could think about if we're going to have a really robust public process, um, how is that going to be managed? Um, and I so guess let, so, that's so let me, um, uh, we're getting on to an hour and a half, and I, I don't want to go too much beyond that. And, and before Michael Burris, uh, who's a lot of this work is going to fall onto his shoulders and uh, and his staff. Uh, let me suggest, uh, and this is kind of what Joseph Inglesby said, and a little bit what you said, Phil. Um, how to combine the fact that we have. Uh, one, two, three, four, five distinct committees with uh, distinct missions, distinct personalities. Uh, and we want to keep that, but we want one report that will be read by uh, a, a person and we don't want them to get confused by, you know, uh, different terms being used differently and different formats that where, where they just get confused. Uh, and so um, see if this captures it for you, Michael Burris. And that is that you might give to the five chairs of these committees. Uh, uh, a as minimal as you can, uh, something that that Joseph was getting at, which is here's a guideline for what we'd like in terms of when you submit the report. Um, things like uh, it needs to have at the end uh, recommendations in two categories, public policy recommendations and recommendations for individual actions. Uh, it should have, uh, and, and I'll get this wrong, you know, it should state what the uh, risks are 
that uh, of climate change in your area, agriculture or water and so on. Uh, and uh, then in, in, in uh, you know, however many, if you've got five of them, list the five. If you've got 12 of them, list the 12. Uh, and then, uh, you know, but break down kind of how you want it, it organized so that the organization in each report is kind of the same. It, it goes from what is the risk and therefore how does it lead to what the policy recommendation is, that kind of thing. So, so that the kind of layout of the report tends to be similar. So as a person is reading the report, they get used to the outline in water is kind of is kind of similar to the outline in agriculture and the terminology is similar the word risk is used the same everywhere in the report we don't go from one word in one report and a different word in another so everyone kind of is using things the same does that make sense michael michael boris yeah, it, it does. And, and just a comment, kind of have an, I have an overarching comment of what's been discussed. So I think every, everyone's right. This, this is a very iterative process. And, and I think ultimately what we're, what we should be trying to develop here are long, uh, long term policy recommendations to bring to the select board. So we're a bit of bit of a ways off from that, but you know, right now the phase that we're in is we're kind of just documenting the problems, um, and, and I think taking those uh, concepts to the the select board to communicate those problems at hand. I think you know that's that's definitely a good next step. Um, but then after that, I think there definitely we definitely do need to have some of those conversations with people from the community. Um, to get their thoughts on those problems that we have brought to the select board to help inform um, policy approaches. Um, and so to the, the credit of the engagement subcommittee, they have already started some, some of this work. Um, and I, I, John, you mentioned having um, some public meetings for this and I think public meetings are, are one way to get at it. Um, I do want to say that I think it's also helpful to try to be, meet people in more informal settings than at public meetings. I think informal yep. settings can be a little bit more approachable to a lot of people where there's not, you know, there's not so much focus on, on you in front of a group of people. You don't have to be a content expert. Yep. Um, and so I think do, like doing outreach at, you know, the farmer's market, for example, that's like a really great venue to do something like this. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think it, what's been been said here so uh, um, uh, on this topic, I think we're we're on the right track. All right, uh, Joseph, you got your hand up. You know, I was going to say that for agriculture, you know, if you were to look at a format, a general format, what what uh, I'll, I'll discuss this with, with Ray, but we could, we could do like a general narrative, then uh, look at land use features, for example, and the impacts of climate change on that. Um, we could also do interviews, and what I recommend is actually talking to the farms and fishers and get their feelings, uh, get their uh, uh, comments and concerns, and then uh, be, be able to bundle that into then public policies and, uh, and uh, private recommendations you know, for the future. That be, would be one, one format that could be followed. But I also want to mention that that uh, Michael's graphics are really quite powerful. And if you were to do a, a presentation, for example, public presentation, they would have a series of overlays uh, that would show you, uh, say, Westport uh, in the past, Westport in the present, uh, projections of Westport in the future, looking at flooding, looking at other changes, uh, development patterns. Um, you can actually see a direct um, uh, uh, impact of climate change, uh, whether it's on historic structures, coastal development, um, even, even uh, uh, changes uh, that you might find in terms of the topography. So uh, 
would that be helpful? You know, to well, I think Joseph, what I'm trying to get at in terms of uh, format, and I'll just use two examples, is in the health area, there are kind of three uh, segments. Mm -hmm. It's getting hotter. S segment one. Now, obviously, you're going to back that up and get more detailed. Mm -hmm. People, segment two, people die of heat. More people die of heat than die from floods, hurricanes, anything else. It kills more people than any other part. That's segment two. Segment three is the policy recommendation. You know, people should have a place they can go with air conditioning to escape the heat. So the first one is it's hotter. The impact is people die of heat. And the third is, what do you do about it? What's the policy recommendation? Is that a public policy recommendation or is that a private individual one? It may be both. Just three things. Now, in agriculture, uh, to, to take one, you said with uh, global warming, beech trees are developing diseases, leaf diseases, and they are done, all right? So it's getting warmer, impact, beech trees are, are we're losing our, the beech trees that define our, uh, our forests. I don't know what the public policy or what the policy is there, but is there a policy there about saving our beech trees? But it's, it's the same one, two, three. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's how do you put in every one of these things, what's the phenomena that's happening? Sea levels rising mm -hmm. or the air temperatures getting warmer or what is the phenomena? What's the impact? Who's getting affected by it? And what's the public policy to mitigate that impact? One, two, three. Everything goes into that one, two, three. Mm -hmm. Perfect. You see, that's something we can actually follow, you know? Exactly. So, and we can do that across the board. That's right. And I'm pretty sure the, the water, that, that's the way Mike Sullivan, the water committee's got that done. I, I think that, as you said, everyone can follow that. Okay. Look, I think this has been uh, two hands are raised, Mike Sullivan and then Jim White. We're getting close to the end here, though. Mike, Mike Sullivan, I think you're muted. I, I think you got to where I was going to go to, John. It's just it's there's there's a time for detailed formatting to try to achieve uniformity and clarity and all that across consistency across the board. But right now, I think the committees just need to um identify as you said identify the driver the problem how it affects westport and are there any recommendations or areas of further study it's just it's and when michael has all of these six reports in front of him he'll be in a much better place yeah. or a much better position to try to go back and say hey let's reformat let's use these terms let's do that because i to ask him to do that now you're asking them in a vacuum yeah okay I think it's a better time to format jim white just quickly, uh, I was thinking that perhaps there should be four sections. Uh, third would be possible solutions, and fourth would be the recommendation. All right, that's a possibility. Let, yeah, we'll see how it goes as the, these things get done. But I think, look, we've gotten an awful lot done today, really, an awful lot done. And there's a lot of progress in all of these uh, reports. Uh, and so we're going to meet again December 14th. All of the committees, uh, I hope, will meet at least once before that. And uh, so keep in mind that uh, we're hoping to get the reports in, you know, the early part of next year uh, completed.
if you if you want to get it in the end of this year, that, that's even be better. Is there a motion to adjourn? Okay. So Thank you all, everyone. Very exciting.